Good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate your time today coming out and joining us. My name is Jackie Hefner, and I will be your host today for the webinar with Anita Archer. I have a couple quick details to review before we get started. If you have questions, please submit the questions in the Q&A box on your screen. Make sure to include me as the host, so send them to the host and presenter so I can track them to review with Anita at the end of the session instead of just sending them to the presenter. You can find the Q&A box if you're a PC user running a Windows machine. It's going to be in the upper right-hand top corner of your screen. There'll be an icon with a question mark. If you're on a Macintosh, it's going to be in the lower right-hand corner, and those are kind of tiny icons on the bottom. Again, you're just kind of looking for a question mark that you can click on there. Uh, if you're viewing the webinar today and you run into trouble with technical issues, send a message to me as the host. I'm happy to do what I can to try to get you sorted out. We do find sometimes that there's a hiccup with the audio broadcasting if there's lots of people accessing the Internet at your school all at the same time. Uh, we can send you a phone number to call into the audio broadcast by phone if you have trouble with that. As always, we're recording today's webinar and we'll make it available on our website at the archive webinars page. We'll send you out a link to remind you uh, when it's available and it's live. All that said, let's get things turned over to Anita Archer. Thank you, Jackie, and welcome to all of you on this uh, beautiful day in Portland, Oregon, where it's trying to be spring, but it's yet to come. Uh, and you know, when we talked about topics, one of the things that has been reoccurring in my professional life is being in schools, maybe schools that are uh, schools that are really trying to improve the achievement of their students, and they ask me, you know, Anita, we have so many possibilities of things that we could focus on. What is the most important? And I said, well, first, in terms of the students, focus on learning. Learning is the outcome. It's sort of like if I was a corporate president, uh, the outcome would be profits. If I am an educator, the outcome is learning. And so keep focused on what do we know that's going to make a difference in terms of learning. And that brings us right to instruction, because it is the power of the instruction uh, that is most likely to assist students in learning, in science, in social studies, uh, in reading, in math, uh, in writing, in any of the areas that we teach. So the magic is in the instruction. Uh, and so we are going to look at uh, a way of looking at and categorizing what we teach that I think really resonates with teachers. Because in one case, we teach facts. We also teach kids how to do things, strategies, and we also teach them vocabulary and concepts. Uh, and we can really look at pedagogy, instruction, in terms of facts, strategies, and concepts. So uh, let's just remind ourselves uh, of what does make a difference in our schools, because we can be taken off track so quickly away from what it's going to be empowering to our teachers, empowering to our students, the quality of instruction. So I looked at some of the reviews on this question. Uh, and uh, so, uh, first of all, that's a contact information. We have a website with uh, videos that go along with a book on instruction that I wrote with Charles Hughes at Penn State. You can check those out. My email address is also on there. All right. So, uh, reading a book uh, called Embedded Formative Assessment by Dillian William, uh, he made this statement as a summary of his research on uh, what would make a difference. And he said, and read it with me, the quality of teachers is the single most important factor in the educational system. Now, this is my 50th year. I feel so blessed. My 50th year of teaching and working with teachers. And Sometimes uh, we have kind of um, misinterpreted here because the quality of teachers is not the quality of the person, their soul. Uh, it is the quality of their teaching. And so I reworded this a little bit. Forgive me, Dylan. Uh, and read it with me. The quality of teaching is the most important factor in the educational system. So I sort of envision that there is a basket of research-validated practices. 
Uh, and our job as teachers uh, is to continually add those things to our repertoire that we use every day with intentionality that makes a difference for our student learning. Uh, and similarly, uh, many of you, because I recognize some of your names, are staff development uh, individuals. And so you have to say, okay, what are those research practices that make a significant difference that we should stress within staff development? Well, we've had other people uh, review the same type of research. Uh, and uh, here, once again, I reworded it a little bit. Uh, so looking at this research, uh, read the top one with me and go. The quality of an educational system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. Yes, but it's sort of like a surgeon. It's not the person, man or woman, it is the quality of their surgery that makes a difference. And that's the same here. So read the reworded version. The quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of the teaching. And this is the truth that I see again and again and again. We can have wonderful central administration, and we need you. Uh, we can have great state department uh, individuals and staff de development, and we need you. Uh, we can have great administrators at the school level, uh, and we need excellence in that administration. But in the end, it is going to be the quality of teaching in every one of your classes, every single day, bell to bell, that makes the most difference. Well, I think that probably all of us have experienced the truth of this. It is the quality of instruction. Last week, I had an opportunity to work uh, in a school district, a small school district, but it was so delightful with all of the elementary teachers in Klamath Falls, Oregon. And I got to teach second graders and third and fourth and fifth graders uh, lessons in their new reading program. And I was reminded once again of how critical uh, the quality of that teaching was. And I was able to use uh, this uh, category system uh, that we could take anything you teach and say, is it a fact uh, or an information? Thus, what do we want uh, children to know? Is it skills or strategies, how to do something? Is it vocabulary and concepts? And this really is useful because in a lesson, I might uh, pre-teach background knowledge for an article. I might pre-teach vocabulary. I might teach students annotation, uh, how to underline uh, critical information in response to a task, and then to write notes in the margin. So. Uh, in my lesson, I might have many of these things, but then I could stop and ask myself, ah, what do I know about teaching facts? What do I know about teaching strategies? What do I know about teaching vocabulary? Now, of course, in an hour, I can't model this in depth, but I have the feeling that you come to this webinar with great background knowledge, and so it'll be a reminder uh, of what you know, but maybe a way to organize it to share it with teachers. Uh, so, let's look at the first one, uh, which are facts and knowledge. You know, one of the things that's happened as I have been traveling in the last year across states and across countries to Australia is I've had a number of people tell me, Anita, we should not teach facts and knowledge anymore. Uh, facts constantly are growing uh, and people have Google and other resources. We do not need to teach any facts. And I'm kind of surprised by this, given how useful it is to have, like, facts. It's very useful to have factual knowledge available to us. And if we've learned it, stored it in our brain, we can use it for problem solving. Uh, in fact, even without us asking our brain, give me this information, it does it automatically. Uh, intellectual pursuits are based on we have some knowledge. Not only that, we have very good research to show the relationship of facts and knowledge to things like comprehension in reading. So just to get us over saying, oh, we don't need any, uh, let's look exactly why we do need some. One, a background knowledge uh, is going to be highly related uh, to content knowledge. I always use 
uh, Powell Bookstore as a reminder of this. If you came to Portland, Oregon, and asked me, what should you do in Portland? I'd say, go to Powell's Bookstore. It's the largest bookstore in the United States. It is a wonderful place for you, uh, the educator. And when I go there, which is almost every weekend I'm home, uh, I go immediately to the Rose Room. Children's literature, education, philosophy, comparative religion, ooh, everything I adore is there. And I have really good background knowledge in those subjects and have excellent comprehension. But I always imagine, and this is total imagination, that down in the basement of PALS is a gray room. A gray room that is labeled engineering. Now, if I was to go to that imaginary room and pick out any book, my comprehension would be very low because of no background knowledge. I would need to have someone give me some background knowledge, some essential, a sli slice of background knowledge so that I could understand it. And that's where our children are. Nine-year-olds, 12-year-olds, even 17-year-olds uh, don't necessarily have all the background knowledge that's going to allow them optimum comprehension. Uh, so when I looked at the research on teaching facts, I pulled from it four words that are extraordinarily useful to remember, and I hope you're going to remember them after this session, uh, to assist students in teaching and gaining, teachers teaching and students gaining factual information. Uh, and I'm going to even add some hand signals, and wherever you're sitting, you get to join me. Uh, and so if I want students to remember a factual knowledge. I want them to attend. I want them to intend to learn it. I want them to rehearse it. And then I want them to retrieve it. So doing it with me, and I'm watching you, so that <laughs> I want them to attend. I want them intend to learn it. I want them to rehearse it. And then I'm going to have to have them retrieve it. And I might have to organize it in a way uh, through graphic organizers, uh, through concept maps, so it will be easier to obtain. Attend, intend, rehearse, and retrieve. Now, for a moment, you're going to be my students. So I had the gift one day of preparing kids for reading an article uh, that they had in a bird unit in elementary school, and they were going to read about emperor penguins. And for that purpose, we had to learn about uh, Antarctica, uh, the environment in which the emperor penguins uh, thrive. And this is factual information that I wanted them to know. Now, if you're sitting with a colleague, I want you to give yourself the numbers one and two so that you can participate. If you are all by yourself, then you're going to have to have a virtual partner. And so just lean over and pretend but you'll gain more from this if you actually participate. I can't hear you, but I'm expecting you to participate. Attend, intend, rehearse, and retrieve. So you are now my students. Okay, looking up here. We're going to be reading an article about Antarctica, about emperor penguins in Antarctica, and to really understand that we have to start with some background knowledge. First, the continent on which we would find emperor penguins is Antarctica. Say it, Antarctica. Now, put your hand on uh, your table and tap out and say the parts of that word. Antarctica. One more time, Antarctica. Say it all together, Antarctica. Now, teacher talk. The reason I had you slow it down and say the parts is if I expect you to learn about Antarctica, I've got to ensure you can pronounce it. And slowing it down and saying the parts, uh, and basically segmenting it into the oral syllables will assist with that. So that day I held up a globe as I taught it. So here is on the globe the continent of Antarctica. Uh, and it is the most southern of the continents. And read the first bullet with me. Twice the size of Australia. You know, we've already studied Australia. We thought it was a huge continent. 
but Antarctica is twice the size. Now, if we look carefully at this globe or this map, there is a point that is labeled South Pole. Uh, what is it labeled as? South Pole. You know, earlier in the year, we talked about the North Pole, uh, a specific place, but uh, on the, uh, in the Arctic called the South North Pole. And then we have now the South Pole. And between that, we have an imaginary line called the axis. And we've talked about how the Earth rotates. Well, it re rotates on that axis. So children, that's you, uh, pretend that uh, you are uh, holding a globe and put a finger up here for the North Pole, finger down here for the South Pole, and rotate on the axis. Beautiful. Well, uh, we also uh, need to understand the land of Antarctica uh, and read the first bullet with me. Ice covers all but 2.4% of the land. So almost the whole land is covered in ice. Only this small little bit is not covered in ice. Uh, and Unfortunately, because of global warming, the amount of land that is not covered in ice has increased. And we have many uh, experimental labs uh, in Antarctica watching for signs and results of global warming. Well, read the next bullet with me again about the ice. 90% of ice found on the Earth is in Antarctica. Now, this is not talking refrigerator ice, it's not talking ice cubes, it's talking glaciers and snow. But 90% of the ice found on the Earth is found on the continent of Antarctica. Well, these big ideas, not the details, but the big ideas I want you to remember, that Antarctica is covered in ice and that almost all of the ice in the world is found in Antarctica. So the percentages you might not remember, but those big ideas you will. So let's give you a moment, bless you, yeah, let's give you a moment to study here because uh, you're going to have to teach it to a partner in a moment. So going back and studying these two slides. Okay, partner ones, without looking at the slides, uh, I want you to tell your partner uh, what you've learned about the land of Antarctica. And start by saying, here's some things you need to know about the land of Antarctica. Repeat that sentence starter with me, everybody. Here's some things you need to know about the land of Antarctica. And ones, tell your partner, but use the sentence starter. All right, so there in that little tiny demonstration is what I would like teachers to do, not to rip through factual information, uh, but to have students attend, have them intend to learn it, have them rehearse it, and have them retrieve it. Uh, without rehearsal and retrieval, just coverage, the retention will be non-existent. Uh, and so one reason that we want to teach background knowledge uh, is that the more background knowledge I have, the more comprehension I will have. There's more than one reason, though. Number two, the more knowledge I have, the more I will learn. Yes, the more knowledge I have in a domain or about a topic, the more I'm going to learn when new information is presented. And we know this. So that we've studied education for a long time, and so when we read something new, uh, then uh, we're going to gain more knowledge than the novice educator. Number three, and this is important, 
the seed of curiosity is knowledge. So the day that I taught uh, this lesson, uh, which happened to be in uh, California, uh, but uh, I went on to teach them about the climate uh, and that Antarctica, because it is the driest place on Earth, is considered a desert. And on the second day that I was there, the principal came to me and said, Anita, would you mind talking to a father whose son came home and said, Dad, did you know that Antarctica is a desert? And Dad said, no, son, we went to Arizona last year. It is not a desert. It has to be really, really hot to be a desert. Who told you that? The visiting professor. Oh, he called the principal. The principal came to me and said, would you talk to him? And so I did. We had a wonderful discussion about the fact that uh, the term desert uh, is employed when uh, a place has less than 10 inches of uh, precipitation in a year. It has nothing to do with temperature. And yes, Antarctica is a desert. And then he said, but look at the pictures of it. Uh, it has snow. I said, yes, but that could be 100-year-old snow. It never gets above freezing. The snow comes, it stays. Uh, oh, he said, that is so interesting. But the point of this example is the boy got the seed of interest by learning that Antarctica was a desert. He shared it with his father. His father was curious enough uh, that he called me and talked and then followed it up in other emails as he got more information. That curiosity is not like inherent. It is related to domains. And so that uh, when I get a little knowledge, I am curious. So we get three benefits of knowledge, more comprehension, uh, more learning because we have something to connect it to, and number three, more curiosity. We don't just wake up one day and say, oh, I want to uh, Google DNA. Yes, it's DNA day. Rather, like the most recent time I did this, I read an article about the studies of DNA in relationship to schizophrenia. And I said, wow, I want to learn more. So I immediately uh, went online in search of information about that. Well, we teach uh, facts. And we have good reason for doing it. We have them attend, intend, rehearse, and retrieve. Well, uh, what else do we teach? Much of what we teach are skills and strategies, how to do something how to sound out a word, how to write a paragraph, how to take notes in a high school st a class uh, using two-column uh, Cornell notes, how to annotate a informational article, how to solve a multi-step story problem. We teach kids how to do things all through the grades. And we have had good information on how to teach this for a long time. Uh, and so, for example, uh, I'm certain that the words demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding, right out of Madeline Hunter's work, are very familiar to you. If I want to teach you how to do something, I demonstrate it. Uh, I guide you then in doing it. I don't go right to independent practice, and then I check your understanding. Uh, and uh, many years ago, uh, 1977 actually, and some of you were not born then, I wrote a document uh, with some colleagues for uh, uh, Council for Exceptional Children on instruction. And to make it more memorable of uh, demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding, uh, uh, we taught, used the words, I do it, we do it, you do it. I do it, we do it, you do it. Everybody join me in that. I do it, we do it, you do it. But often, it's more like this. Uh, you remember, and I know that you're well-versed in the gradual release of responsibility. I do it, I do it, we do it, we do it, we do it. We, gradual release of responsibility. We do it, you do it. Uh, and so I'm going to share with you an uh, event that happened uh, in February last month that really reinforced uh, the importance of I do it, we do it, you do it. 
So actually, it was not at a school site. I had the great gift uh, in February of taking a trip. I have a group of uh, people that every two or three years we go to some place in the world to expand our knowledge, our empathy, uh, our uh, work with other people. And so we went to uh, Southeast Asia, uh, to uh, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and then South Korea. Uh, and uh, we took a boat trip uh, that went down uh, the Mekong River. And it was both a enlightening trip and a sobering trip. But one day in the afternoon on our tour uh, in Saigon, we had a cooking class. Uh, and I was thrilled to have this cooking class. And here is our teacher. Uh, and she is in a cooking school that she uh, has many teachers and many students. And you see that she is all prepared. She got her chef hat on. She got her microphone on. And she says, all right, first thing we're going to learn is how to do spring rolls that you would find in a Thai or Vietnamese restaurant. I said, yes, because I have tried spring rolls. I love spring rolls. I have tried to make them for guests. And they've always turned out fat, and they always fall apart. I have not discovered uh, how to make spring rolls. And so I was very motivated uh, to have spring rolls talk to me. Now, this teacher, she knew about what to do uh, when you teach spring rolls. To a, to a point, but not perfect. Uh, she knew that you start with demonstration. So this is what she said. She did exactly what we want in good modeling, all the way up to I am teaching a high school class uh, how to add power to their introduction on an argument. Same thing, uh, that we want to use show and tell. I show you how to do it. I tell you how to do it, uh, both what I am thinking as well as what I'm doing. And I might even get responses from you but particularly show and tell. So the teacher says, first you need a basket, uh, and it is a very low basket, and it has slats that go vertically uh, and horizontally. Oh, I said, all right, I've got to buy baskets. That's the first thing I didn't do. And then she said, you take the circular uh, rice paper, and you lay it in the basket, uh, and you wet your hands, and you make it wet. Oh, that's the second thing I've done wrong. I've soaked mine. Oh, don't soak them. Okay. Uh, so you lay it down. Then she said you take up the sides and you take them one-third over. Each of them one-third and one-third, leaving one-third in the middle. Okay. Uh, and then you pat that down. And then we had three bowls and she said, now you take some sprouts. Don't overdo the sprouts. Just lay a few down in the middle. Okay, another mistake. I like went for lots of sprouts. No wonder mine were too fat. Then she said, now take some parsley and lay the parsley down. And next, uh, you have some pieces of pork. Lay the pork down. You have a shrimp. Break it in two and lay each part down, one on each side. Okay, now I've got the ingredients that go in the middle. She's definitely improved upon what I've done. Now, take it and fold it in some more and go to the edge and begin to roll and do it tight. Roll, 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 roll tight. Uh, and then uh, take it and you just get your hands wet again and seal it off. And then she showed us, because there's a mirror behind her that showed everything, a beautiful spring roll. I said, excellent demonstration. Uh, she did exactly what we had hoped. She did show and tell. Uh, and in the show, she slowed it down. She went uh, very explicitly, and she told us how to do it, told us what to do and what to think. Yay! And then she said, now, pick up your materials, get your basket in front of you, and make one. Oh, no! She went directly from modeling to independent practice. I knew that was not good. Uh, and I've seen it again and again in math classes, in reading classes, language arts, elementary, secondary, where the teacher goes from demonstration immediately to independent practice. So she stepped off the stage, the chef. And I said, come over here. And I said, would you lead me and my table through this? 
And she, I said, tell me each step, have us do it, tell us a step and have us do it so that we can do it correctly. And she was game and she did it beautifully. So she said, put down your basket, put your rice in it, get your hands wet, spread it out, put it one third in, put a few spots down, then a little parsley down, then the pork, then the, uh, uh, the shrimp, uh, fold it in, roll it tight, and under that guidance, step by step, all four of us at my table, <sighs> we did beautiful spring rolls. And then she said, okay, you're looking good, now do it on your own. Yes. So she did, because we had to add the we do it. She did, I do it, we do it, you do it. But I have to tell you, I never would have discovered that. I needed her. I needed some explicit instruction to make this work. To prove the point, there they are. Ooh, the ones we did with her, the ones we did on our own. The ones in the right hand corner are mine. I still need some improvement on it. But the big point is, afterwards, I told her about I do it, we do it, you do it. So I was even able to leave just a kernel of education in Vietnam. Uh, but uh, this seems so simple, but our teachers are not consistently doing it. Many of them know about demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding. Many of them even know the terminology, I do it, we do it, you do it. Or the shrunken version, I do, we do, you do. But we're not doing it. And yet I see again and again in schools that dedicate themselves to being certain when new skills and strategies are taught, I do it, we do it, you do it, uh, is utilized. Uh, so let's go back to academics. Though, I just took you to one of the sweet events uh, on my trip to Asia. And I hope that she makes a poster and she trains all of her uh, people that work with her who teach. I do it, we do it, you do it. It'd be great for chef schools. But let's look at education. So uh, mm -hmm. here is a strategy that, because we have K-12 uh, online, here is a strategy that many of you are familiar with. came out of the research of Doug and Lynn Fuchs and Pat Mathis. A strategy that I find particularly useful for reading informational text. Uh, that students would read a paragraph in paragraph shrinking, then they name the who or, hut, who or what of the main person, animal, or thing. Then they tell an important thing about who or what. Uh, and then they say the main idea in 10 words or less. Actually, this is sort of a form of close reading because you've read the informational paragraph and you have to go back closely and ask yourself, name the who or what. Then you have to tell the most important thing about it. Then you have to say the main idea in 10 words or less so that you really have to read it more than one time. You have intentionality in what you're doing and you have to read it closely. You might even have to write down the main idea sentence. So, be my students again. Uh, and remember, participation will help. And so talk out loud or talk to your uh, imaginary partner or real partner as we do this. So let's say I've introduced this to students, which is factual knowledge. So I've gone through it. They had to attend. They had to intend to learn it. They had to rehearse it. They had to retrieve it. So we've already practiced this. Uh, and now I am going to model how to put this into play. It's a strategy, so I need to use, I do it, we do it, you do it. So if I am going to model it or demonstrate it, that is show and tell. I should proceed step by step and tell you what I am doing. So be my students. Okay, we have already been introduced students to um, the paragraph shrinking strategy. Uh, my turn to model it. But first, let's read the paragraph together. And so, read the title with me and go. The Coldest Continent. I hope you're participating. Remember, uh, active participation is the heart of all good instruction. So, participate. I'm going to read when I stop, say the next word. Antarctica is not like any other continent. It is as far as south as you can go on earth. 
The South Pole is found there. Ice covers the whole land. In some places, the ice is almost three miles thick. Beneath the ice are mountains and valleys. So we have read the paragraph, and now we have to uh, use our strategy. And we start by uh, going back here, naming the who or what. So I say to myself, looking at that paragraph, uh, who or what it is about uh, is, it says South Pole, but that whole paragraph is not about the South Pole. It talks about ice. Now, obviously, ice is important here, but what it's really talking about uh, is Antarctica. So I say to myself, the who or what is Antarctica? Next, I have to, let's go back to the strategy here. I have to tell the most important thing about the who or what. Hmm. Well, okay, Antarctica. What do I really want to remember about Antarctica? Well, I definitely would want to remember that it is as far south as you go on the Earth, so I know the location of it. And I also want to remember that ice covers the whole land. Uh, and so uh, those two things are the main things I want to remember. Now, the third step of the strategy uh, is to say the main ideas in 10 words or less. So you get to be my partner and count. Uh, and so I'm asking myself, uh, hmm, okay, I have to include the who or what and the most important information. Let me try. Antarctica is the most southern of all of the continents and is covered in ice. And you would say, shrink it, because it has to be less than 10 words. Okay, let me try again. Antarctica, comma, the most southern state, comma, you have to count it, is covered in ice. Excellent. Ooh. So there, I modeled it, and when I modeled it, uh, I did exactly what we talked about. Let's see if I can get this to go back. Uh, I showed you how to do it. I told you what I was doing and thinking, and I even gained some responses from you. Now, the most important part of I do it, we do it, you do it, is not the I do it. We want to model dynamically one or two times. Uh, but it is the part we most often leave out, which is the we do it, where I guide you in doing it. So let's uh, see what that would look like. And popping over to our next passage. So when I guide you, most often I guide you by asking you or telling you what the step is and having you do it. Telling you the step and having you do it. Telling you the step and having you do it. So, let's first read this paragraph. You're my students again. And we're going to do this one together. So, I'm going to read the first part of a sentence. And you're going to read to the end punctuation and stop. The weather in Antarctica is harsh. It is the coldest place on Earth. The temperature does not get above freezing. It is also the windiest place in the world. Teacher talk. I'm infusing some different ways to read material with a whole class. I used close procedure, not close, but close, C-L-O-Z-E, the first time where I read, stopped, and you said the next word. Here, I read, stopped, and you completed the sentence. Okay, back to being my students. So the first thing we have to do is uh, we have to name the who or what. Uh, so think uh, what this paragraph is about uh, and whisper to your partner the who or what. Now the day I taught this, some students said Antarctica, some students said weather, uh, but we concluded that it was weather in Antarctica. And being my students, next 
we have to tell the most important information about the weather in Antarctica. So think about it. And ones, you're going to tell your partner about the weather in Antarctica, and you're going to start by saying, uh, here's some important things about the weather in Antarctica. Okay, and I give feedback as I listen in. Some of you said it was the coldest place on Earth uh, and the windiest place on Earth, uh, that uh, the temperature didn't get above freezing. Any of those ideas could be used. And the next thing we have to do is we have to, uh, in this case, write a main idea statement of 10 words or less. But when the researchers did this, they said, ah, for the uh, who, the naming the who or what, if you have a phrase, you can count it as one word. So I want you to take a moment as I'm doing this and write down a main idea statement that includes the uh, who or what, weather in Antarctica, uh, and the most important information. And have the total count be less than 10 words, though the phrase you use for who or what is counted as one. So writing yours down as I write mine. Of course, I'd be moving around and monitoring their work, uh, not writing, but we don't have uh, any virtual children here. Okay, so read your sentence to your partner. And then I might give them some examples. My example is the weather in Antarctica uh, is very, extremely cold and windy. The weather in Antarctica is extremely cold and windy. You might have said uh, the weather in, or Antarctica ha has the coldest and windiest weather in the world. That would have been another sentence that you could have used. So basically, I modeled here, I do it, we do it, and there's a high probability that we might need we do it, we do it, we do it, we do it, until the students had mastered the strategy, then you do it. And then, of course, we could use this for our close reading of informational text. Well, we have one more to go. What else might we want to teach? Uh, and, and that is vocabulary and concepts. Again, one of the things that I am being told constantly is, you know, we should not do any front-loading for children before they read something or have a unit of knowledge. For example, we shouldn't teach vocabulary. Uh, we should have the students, uh, through context clues, discover it. Well, I might heartily disagree uh, because there's a number of reasons. One, context clues don't always work. Many times the con context clues are not uh, explicit enough. You've got to teach kids to use them. But if there's a real important concept in the unit or in what we're going to read, I'm going to teach it to students because the context clues may not be strong enough to give an accurate meaning. But here's something more important. Uh, it takes a number of exposures to learn vocabulary. And when you figure it out with context uh, clues, there's a high probability you're not going to retain it. In fact, that's exactly what Anderson and Nagy found in their studies, that there was only retention uh, between 5 and 15 percent, not 100 percent of the words you figured out using context clues. Uh, so I'm going to pluck some words out and teach it explicitly. And I am going to use quality instruction. And so uh, when we wrote the book, Charles Hughes and I wrote the book uh, on explicit instruction, effective and efficient teaching, uh, we looked at uh, all the studies we could find on expressly explicitly teaching vocabulary and sort of from many of the instructional procedures uh, adopted these steps in the procedure. But first, let's look again at why we should teach it. 
One, vocabulary is so related to uh, comprehension. And that means we want to ensure vocabulary to ensure comprehension. Uh, and Marzano, in a book that he wrote about vocabulary, concluded this. And when I stop, say the next word. Direct vocabulary instruction has an impressive track record of improving students' background, knowledge, and comprehension of academic content. Uh, in fact, one of the best studies in this area done by the late Steve Stahl uh, had an effect size of 0.97. Wow. Uh, and Hattie's a recent review of vocabulary programs uh, had an effect size of 0.67. So we got, we've got research on our back on this one, that children really benefit from learning vocabulary, and one way we can address it is through explicit instruction. So uh, utilizing those studies that we looked at and pulling together uh, a way to teach it, uh, this was the instructional routine that we used. First, we introduced the words pronunciation. You know, if you can't pronounce the word, then you can't attach meaning to it, you cannot rehearse it, uh, you uh, simply will not be able to attach meaning to it, store it, and retrieve it. So you've got to have the pronunciation. And then we introduce the meaning, giving a student-friendly explanation. And we illustrate it with examples, and in some cases, we'll just oppose it to non-examples. And then we'll ask questions of the students to check their understanding. So we introduce the pronunciation, the meaning, illustrate it with some examples, and check understanding. I think this is very close to what you do. And again, uh, many of us know what would be good vocabulary instruction. It's just a matter of getting it consistently in place to empower our students, whether they're in kindergarten or as I had the great gift of last year teaching chemistry lessons, that they would have vocabulary for chemistry. So let's look at one example. Uh, and uh, so we're going to even teach it together so we're all uh, present. First, we introduce the pronunciation, teach it with me, and go. This word is protect. What word? And the students would say protect. Tap and say the parts of the word. Protect. Again, uh, say the parts, protect. And the whole word, protect. See, our whole purpose here is to ensure they can pronounce it. If you can pronounce it, you can attach meaning to it, store it, and subsequently retrieve it. Well, uh, then we're going to introduce the meaning. And one way uh, is to give them a student-friendly explanation and teach it with me and go. To protect someone or something means to present, prevent them from being harmed or damaged. So when we keep someone from being harmed or damaged, we protect them. So we introduce the meaning. But that would obviously not be enough. We would have to add some examples uh, that would illustrate the meaning. Maybe examples directly related uh, to the unit or to the content that the students are going to read. Uh, or uh, ones that are directly related to their personal life. Maybe a balance of those two. Uh, so when we use examples, we could use ones that are concrete. Uh, for example, one day I was teaching vase, and I brought a vase to class. It did not last the day. It was a big mistake, but anyway, the students saw the vase. Another way to make it concrete is to add actions. So one day I had the opportunity uh, to teach a mammal unit, and I was there on hippopotamus day. And the hippo, uh, in order to stay cool during the day, submerges underwater and then emerges as it cools down to move out and grace. So uh, get your hands ready and do it with me. So we would, uh, after we learned the meanings, we would have an example, submerge and emerge, submerge and emerge. We could also have visual examples. I celebrate uh, the uh, availability of video or uh, visuals. 
I mean, all you have to do is Google a word, go to images, pull out your very favorite one, land it in a PowerPoint, and you're set to go. Would your uh, students that are English language learners benefit from visual examples? Absolutely. But it's useful to remember that we are all English language learners with a uh, absolute uh, number of words of more than a million in English, we are all uh, definitely English language learners. So visual examples, maybe some directly related to the passage, some related to personal experience. The passage we're reading uh, here is about how the uh, father uh, of protects the chick. The impropinent father, not the mother, protects the egg and then the chick. So read the bullet with me and go. This father penguin will protect his chick from harm. Uh, so that is related to the text we're going to read, but we also use one related to the kids. This special car seat will protect the baby. If there's an accident, he is less likely to be hurt. So we introduce the pronunciation, the meaning, and then illustrate it with some examples. Uh, and we might just use verbal examples. Go down to the bottom and read them with me. The father penguin takes care of the egg after it is laid. He protects the egg. Human parents try to protect their children. Well, uh, so we could introduce the meaning, or excuse me, pronunciation, then meaning, then examples, and then we could ask questions to check their understanding. So I um, have a question like, what are some ways that human parents can protect toddlers at a park? And I give the children a chance to think. Now, if I just call on someone and answer, they're going to say, well, watch over your child. Problem there is that they have not used the word protect. I am really uh, a fan of sentence starters because it forces students uh, to utilize the academic language of the domain. So I said to the students, uh, think of your answer. Now, one, say your answer, but start by saying, at a park, parents can protect toddlers by, and they would share with their partner. So I did this recently, and uh, one uh, student said, well, uh, you could protect them uh, by watching over them. At the park, parents can protect toddlers by uh, not being on their cell phone, but having their eyes on the child. At a park, parents can protect toddlers by using a leash. Yeah, that was one of the answers. Uh, so there's other ways that we could check understanding. We could have them discern between examples and non-examples. Uh, we could have them generate examples. Um, and we also could extend their knowledge. Uh, and given we have a language with so many words, uh, we definitely might want to uh, expand by introducing to the relatives. So be my students and echo read. Protect, protect, protecting, protecting, protection, protection, protector, protector. I'm going to read when I stop, say the next word. This mother must protect her child. She is protecting her frightened child. Her child feels safe during the storm because of her mother's protection. Her mother is a great protector. So we have taught it, and the magic is in the instruction, because I can use this uh, whether I'm teaching kindergarten, middle school, or high school, I can use it with words in my reading program. I could use this uh, routine in math. I could use it in science. I could use it in social studies. I could use it in any area. I introduce the words pronunciation. I then introduce the words meaning. I illustrate it with some examples. And then I ask questions to check for understanding. So, these three are one categories that teachers really benefit from understanding how to look at what they're teaching, what category does it fit into, and thus what 
magical instruction. It's really not magical. It's very intentional. Uh, what instruction, what pedagogy might be useful? Uh, and so if we are teaching facts, have them, let's review, attend, intend, rehearse, and retrieve. If I am teaching them skills or strategies, the big ideas are I do it, we do it, you do it. If I'm teaching vocabulary, the big ideas are I introduce the words pronunciation, I introduce the words meaning, I introduce the words examples, and then I introduce questions to check their understanding. Well, I have a rare event happening in my home that's teaching me and reminding me of the power of teaching. Um, so I'm a beginning cellist, uh, and I don't practice very often because of my travels, and so I'm still a definite beginner. But a very elite uh, young man named Ricardo, uh, who's 19 years old, got a scholarship, a full scholarship at Portland State University because of his excellence in music as a cellist. Uh, but even though he got a scholarship, there was no room in the inn. There was no uh, dorm rooms available for uh, winter term. Uh, and so my cello teacher, who is a superb cellist, uh, asked if I could, if Ricardo could stay in my house until the next quarter. Of course. But it's been an interesting experience. Because Ricardo um, has a different culture, different language, different background. And so I've had to teach him uh, things uh, that are necessary for a 19-year-old who's moving into being independent. Uh, and so recently, I was teaching him how to do wash, how to do his clothes. I guess it hadn't been done for quite a while. And I said to myself, okay, Anita, uh, like everything else, you're going to have to, this is a skill. You're going to have to use I do it, we do it, you do it. So I wrote down on a piece of paper, the steps he was to go through. So he had something to refer back to. Uh, number one, sort into light and dark. Number two, uh, put one of those loads in the wash. Number three, add a cap full of, cap full of uh, laundry detergent. Uh, and then come up here and put it on cold, cold, because you don't want your good clothes to shrink. And then number two, go over here. And here you have three choices. Uh, you have... Uh, the choice of large, medium, or small. And he turned to me and he said, Anita, I wear mediums. And I was, I didn't laugh out loud, but I have been checked on ever since because, of course, it was talking about a not a large load, not a small load, but a medium load, not what size you wear. But it reminded me, no matter what the learner is, if they have no background knowledge, uh, don't commit a suicide. Uh, fill them in with what they need to know. So then I had to draw pictures of a full load, a small load, and a medium load because the size of the clothes would make no difference. So luckily, good teaching takes us everywhere. It takes us to Ricardo the cellist from Mexico. It takes us to Vietnam uh, and the chef. It takes us to every class represented here that in the end, it is the quality of instruction. Uh, that makes a difference in terms of student learning. And too often, we've been pulled in many directions, and then uh, we don't concentrate intentionality, bell to bell, on quality instruction, and students' learning drops. And we have to go back and say, oh, I forgot. So may we not forget uh, that the reality is, it is the teaching that makes the difference, the quality of our teaching. Now, Jackie, we just have a few minutes left. Do we have any questions that have popped in? Uh, so far, we don't have any questions, but this would be a great time if people do have queries to send them along. Excellent. You've done a good job of covering things today. I guess so. May I thank all of you for your work in education. 
You know, I'm just going to end with this thought. Uh, a lot of focus right now is on where should children be taught. Should we teach them in uh, a private school, a voucher school, a charter school, a public school? And I just have to remind us, uh, it is not where we teach children that makes a difference. Uh, it's not uh, whether it's public or private, voucher uh, or charter, or under the old oak tree. It is the quality of instruction within our classes that makes a difference. And I'm hoping our country does not get off thinking that it is where. No, it is not where. In all of those environments, it is how we teach and what we teach, the quality of that instruction. So may we hold that path and that understanding to make a difference, whether you're at a state department, uh, in a, a school district office, or in the classroom. It is and will probably always be the quality of instruction that makes a difference. Thanks for being with us. And uh, may you find some use in this webinar. I just wanted to bring your attention to one more thing, and that is this. Uh, every summer uh, in Portland, Oregon, two uh, sessions are held that are basically a trainer of trainers in regard to explicit instruction, particularly designed for people uh, in state departments, uh, in uh, county office of education, uh, in central office, uh, instructional leaders at the school site. Uh, and um, I teach them, and uh, they're also very good, though we've gotten great feedback. It's really wonderful to focus on instruction for five days. So one of them is uh, in June, from the 26th to the 30th, and the second one is coupled with a great conference, the Safe and Civil Schools National Conference, July 16th to 20th. So maybe I'll see some of you there. Uh, you can uh, go to safeandcivilschools.com to find registration information. Well, with that, today I'm off to Montana to work with the State Department. What a delight my day will hold, and I hope yours holds equal delight. Goodbye. <laughs>